So I want you to put your hands together for God's child and my friend, Brian Gaddy. And after his grandmother, Grandmother Gaddy comes along with her solo, the next voice you will hear will be that of none other than Brian Gaddy. Amen. I would like to say good evening to you, to uh, Dr. Mary. Thank you so much for your giving, for sharing to my grandson. And I am the grandson <laughs> <laughs> that I did do the very best that I could in guiding him, telling him not to complain. Uh, it wouldn't get you anywhere, but doing what you're supposed to do would get you somewhere. And it's a great honor and a privilege to be present today um, because um, I guided him and I had the youth self-improvement program and he wanted to be a part of that so to be so glad of that today is he doing this trial to be what he has told grandmama he was called to be and I said, now, uh, are you sure? Come on now. I said, okay. If you call, he called you to, for you to prepare yourself to go. When you get ready to go, he'll let you know. Then you've got to give yourself away so that God can use you. And you will be a blessing all over the world if you give yourself away. I know that. I know that because I give myself away so that God could use me. And he has done great, great things in my life and for others who I have touched through the years. So what I'm going to really say, that this right here, the Youth Self-Improvement Program, by him coming up today, coming forward, he'll be the 21st out of that group that's ministered. We got here uh, Pastor Paul, Paul, Matthew. We got 21, as if he come forward today, that will say that God has called him. And it's been a blessing to have them young people calling me, talking to me, and encouraging me what they're doing at this time. And I'm, I had one to call me last night uh, in Greensboro, Radford Rogers, uh, saying thank you for making him continue to be strong so that he could fight the fight that's before him. And that's, that's the truth. You got to be strong. You got to be strong. If you don't be strong, you won't be able to make it. You got to be strong for God. And I do want to uh, say to my grandson, I am so proud. I am so proud of you because that is the decision that you made after you said he had called you. Then you made that decision to go. I say, son, don't you go until you know he's ready for you. That makes me feel good because I know in your heart you are ready to go. But I know it's a process. I know that. Everything you do is a process. But don't worry about that. If you got him, son, he'll process you until you go where you're supposed to go. I know that. I know that. So I'm going to just sing a little bit of this song that is so touching to me, and he asked me if I would do a, a little bit of that. And I'm so glad. I mean, his mother, maybe somebody know his mother's here. The, 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 uh, Carol. Okay. Uh, my son is here, Dennis, and his wife and family. Uh, his granddad, <laughs> who helped me with him. Hold your hand, son. Hold up your hand there. <laughs> Hold up your hand, sweetie. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the granddad. <laughs> okay, and we got some of his um, other cousins here. Uh, we got some of the members of our church that I go to. 
and his cousins, <laughs> and we're so happy to see you, that you are here to uh, give him support. Thank you so much. And I do want to say, if we all would look at what it means, we would get better and better every day. We would not get bitter. We'd get better and better every day. Because the love life in you and the joy life in you will shine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people do. It doesn't matter what people say. It's what God is doing for you in your life that keep you standing and moving and going on the way he said so. Thank you, Lord. The blood of Jesus shed for me. That was for me. You too. Way back, way back, way back, way back on Calvary. Listen, listen. It was the blood. Lift it, lift it, lift it, my strength. From day, day to day. Listen, listen to him, listen to him. Listen to him. He'll never, he'll never, he'll never let you lose Woo. his power. That's the strength that God got. He won't let you lose his power. Because he's the one that give it to you. The blood of Jesus shed, shed, shed for me. It was way back, way back on Cal, Calvary. <laughs> the blood lifted my strength. From day to day, he'll never, he'll never, he'll never let me lose Ooh. his power. You know why? Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. He's taking me. To the to the highest valley mountain. You know why? You know why? I've already been, I've already been to the low oh it valley. Oh, oh, oh. the blood lifted my strength. From day to day, he won't, he won't, he won't let me lose his power. No, he won't. No, he won't. He won't let you lose his power. He won't let you. You just got to be obedient to God. Do his command that he has for you to do. He won't, he won't, he won't let you lose. His power. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Well, not much I need to say too much after, after that. Thank you, Grandma. Thank you. 
uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here to start this journey with you all today, and I'm, I'm glad that each and every one of you have taken time out of your schedule to be here with me today. Um, let us bow our heads. Father God, here I am, finally, finally, God. Standing before you today with the track shoes removed and the combat boots firmly laced up. You told me a long time ago, God, that, that I'd either stand for you or stand for nothing. And God, I'm tired of standing for nothing. God, I want you to use me to, to deliver your message, deliver your word as you have it delivered and have it received as you have it to be received. Father, this is not about me today. It's, it's all about you. And Lord, I ask that the, the words that I speak, that something is stirred in someone here today that, that brings them closer to you, brings their, their eyes and their hearts and souls closer to you than when they walked in the door, Lord. God, I pray that you renew the spirits of each and every person in here today. Renew their, their minds towards you, God. I, I pray that, that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, just bursts forth like a, like a well that cannot be contained, that just overflows, God. No, Lord, I, I ask that the, the words of my mouth and the, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Amen. Now, first off, I really don't need much of this. I'm a basketball coach, so I can holler up from here probably to Fairmont. <laughs> so um, I, first, I'll, I'll tell you that the devil is something else, mm -hmm. and he knows when to attack you. And everybody here has been in an attack moment at some point in their life. I was attacked back in the bathroom getting ready to come out here, changing my clothes, and Lord, my, my zipper broke. Come on now. I mean, at any other time, that just would have probably sent me over the deep end because, you know, I'm, I get a little antsy over stuff like that. But there was a common spirit that came over me and said, son, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. So that, that's, a, that's an amazing thing. So uh, let's get started today. Um, the text I'll be using today will be coming from Philippians, the third chapter, verses 12 through the uh, 16th verses. And I'll be reading mainly from the New International Version, so you can still follow on. Now, one good thing about God's Word, it doesn't matter how it's translated, it's still His Word. So if you, if you have another version, you can follow along just as well. Uh, starting with verse 12, uh, if you have that, say amen, if, you, if you're reading along with me. Not that I have already attained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward for what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize uh, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. So with that said, the subject I'd like to use today is press on or press out. <laughs> you'll, hear, you'll, hear, you'll, hear that, you'll hear that several times over the next few minutes, so, so bear with me. If you hear it too much, then uh, that means you might be one of the ones that needs to press on. <laughs> so... Uh, the Bible talks about the Christian journey. It's like a pilgrimage. When you become a Christian, you only have begun that pilgrimage. Once you become a Christian, you are then called to press on towards Christ's mark and the great goal of becoming like Christ. You know, there may be a struggle in coming to Christ, but, but no one should ever think that once you've come to him that you finally attain the mark that which, you, which you're seeking. You know, the journey has just begun. You know, you know they say that, that Christians aren't perfect we're just forgiven, and that, that's, that's huge. So we, we recognize that nobody has already arrived, and Christians are not perfect. We're on a journey to become more like Jesus Christ each and every day. Christian maturity doesn't, it doesn't come instantly. It's, it's not a, a stroke of luck. It's not something that you win like the lottery. You just don't 
throw dice down and it's, you know, boom, you hit the number and that's it. You got to work towards it. You know, that's why we should discipline ourselves and work hours and, and work tirelessly in Bible study and prayer and improving our relationships with other people. Uh -oh. Other people, you know, everybody can't do that. So, and we have to work tirelessly because Christian maturity is a process and it requires discipline to become more like Jesus Christ. You know, some people believe that you can have some spectacular experience and in your life and all of a sudden, bang, you've arrived. You're perfect. But we know that's not so. It's never pictured like that for any Bible, anybody in the Bible. You know, in this passage, we've called to be continuously pressing on, pressing forward. That's a warning that Paul gave us that nobody has arrived. You know, and that's, you know, we never reach the level of our spiritual maturity in this life. On this side of the track, we never reach it. So we're always, always reaching, always grabbing towards the next mark. You know, and that only happens once we get in heaven. You know, it can be summed up in the, the Negro spiritual. Yeah, everybody knows it. You know, please be patient with me. God ain't through with me yet. All right. So the first goal that we see is that we must press on. So let's examine verse number 12. So. Paul says, not that I've already obtained all of this or have been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now, that's the Apostle Paul speaking, and what he's saying is, you know, I ain't there yet. I don't even have all the things I'm supposed to have yet. So that tells us that nobody on this side of the Christian walk has yet to make it. Not the pastor, not the deacon, not... T.D. Jakes, not Joel Osteen, Joyce Ma, your mama, my dad, anybody else, you have not made it. So we're called on this journey to keep pressing on. So here's Paul talking about his own life. He had a dramatic experience. You know, he, he, he came across Jesus on the road to Damascus, and for anybody else, you know, that would be something, something spectacular to write home about. Mm -hmm. But for him, that was just the start of his journey. And that was more dramatic than anything that any of us could ever see. But yet, with that said, he still hadn't arrived, and he knew it. So he was called on his pilgrimage to become more like Jesus. So he wasn't satisfied with that encounter. See, some of us, we might have we came up on Jesus and said, well, hallelujah, I met him, I'm good. <laughs> but no, that's just when it's starting then is when you meet him. So spiritual growth requires an ongoing lifetime commitment. Paul wrote this instruction because there were members of the church of Philippi who thought they had finally reached the finish line. <laughs> they thought they had made it and everything was where it needed to be in their life. Uh -huh. And they didn't realize they needed to continuously, continuously push forward. Yeah. So for Paul, the main purpose of his life was to press on in Jesus Christ. For him, everything related to the goal of being more like Jesus. So we need to remember that when we get discouraged and when we get down and we get, we get bogged down and flustered, that we wonder, is it worth it to press on? You know, when we have troubles in the world that seem just too insurmountable to bear, you say, well, well Brian, should we, is it worth it to press on? Yes. Yes, it is. Because you look at, the, what's the alternative? You press out. And I'd rather press on than press out. So those are the times that we have to press on when, when the, the weight of the world gets on us. We have to press forward then. So we're called to be more like Christ and continue to look ahead to the finish line. So Paul wants to make this point crystal clear. He does this through an illustration. He says there, later in the verse, he, he talks about the one who's, who's running the race. You know, the race could only be won when the runner gives his full attention. I mean, think about it. Uh, some of you may, may know about track racing and Olympic racing. Usain Bolt, fastest man on the face of the earth. Do you think he could run as fast as 100 or 200 meter time if he was constantly looking behind him, seeing what was going on behind him? He couldn't. No way you can run fast when you're looking behind you. Go out there and try it right now down Second Street if you think I'm playing. When they ran the race in those ancient times, they would, they would take the victor's prize would be like a wreath that they would take and put on their heads and they put it at the finish line with gold and silver and all other types of, of uh, jewels and things that they, would, that they would race for. So 
for those who were running the race, they would see the prize before them and it would motivate them to run their best race. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the goal of becoming more like Christ, that's what's before us today. We see Jesus Christ in his life and in the scriptures. We have this goal before us of becoming like him. And for Paul, that was an all-consuming goal. This is what we find and when you think about the tortoise and the hare, you know, the, 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 the hare was real fast, and he can go every which way he wanted to, but he got distracted. He got off the beaten path. So the slow turtle, he just kept plodding along. Slowly but surely, the rabbit trying to find every shortcut he can find, the dip behind the woods and the dodge and everyone everywhere else. And at the finish line, he gets there, and, and there goes the tortoise, and the rabbit just don't even understand what's happening. So that's why we're called that, that continual commitment. It may be slow for some of us. Some of us, you may run the race. Some of us, like myself, it's a slower race. But the object is to get to the finish line. And, and that means that's continual Bible study and, and prayer and going to church and doing right by other people. That's big. Again, I, I harp on that because I get that from my grandmother. You do right by other folks. If you do right by other people, God is going to continually do right by you. You know, if our goal is to be more like Jesus Christ, then, then how can we reach that goal? Well, I'm glad you keep asking those good questions. The answer is in verse 13. It requires a commitment to be single-minded. And verse 13 says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, not two, not three, not four or five. One thing that I do is forget what's behind and strain forward for what is ahead. Paul said there are many things, but this one thing he does, he, he strains forward in the race. The pilgrimage of being more like Jesus Christ. He said, I forget what's behind and strain ahead. So Paul's reminder is clear. He, he's emphatic about that. You haven't arrived in your Christian life, and you need to continue the spiritual discipline to keep that moving. You know, I, I, re, I remember when my, when my baby girl, she was just being able to stand up in the crib. You know, she'd get to the edge of the crib, and, you know, she wants you to pick her up. You know, she'd throw them arms out. And you didn't pick her up, and she starts start straining it grunting trying to get you to pick her up to the point where she'd almost flip out the crib. And that's what some of us need to do for God. We need uh, to strain forward, yeah. grunt a little bit to the point where sometimes we might even just flip out. Yeah. But ain't nothing wrong with that. Preach, Gad. We need to forget the past and that's a big thing for a lot of us. You know, so many of us are, are go where uh, somebody did this or somebody said that they did this to me, my, my daddy said that, my, something happened, the person I worked with, man, let that go, that could have been 20 years ago and you're still holding on to that. Uh -huh. And that's what keeps us from moving forward. You know, Paul had a past too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he did some pretty unspeakable things. Uh -huh. He persecuted Christians. Yeah. He, was, he was going all over, all over the land and killing everyone he could find. Just cutting heads off left and right because that's what he was charged to do and he did it with passion he did it with yeah. fervor so God took him and, and, and flipped him around and he took that same passion to go win people for Christ yeah. Amen. you know and, and he could have he could have allowed himself to become paralyzed because of that sorrow and grief of his past and let that hang over him you know, God can't cover me. God can't, won't do this for me because I did this to his people. I did that to his people. But, uh, uh, you know, he said those things are behind me. And I forget that because I've been forgiven through the sacrifice of Jesus' blood. And that covers everything that I've ever done. You, me, and everybody else. So he knew that he couldn't, he couldn't go out and do his work and beat the devil up and beat himself up too. You can't do that. You got to let it go. Amen. You ever wonder why, your, why the windshield in your car is, is 10, 15, 20 times bigger than the rearview mirror that sits on that, that, sits on that windshield? Yeah. 
for the simple fact that you're supposed to spend more time looking forward out the, out the car than looking in the rearview mirror to see what's behind you. Now, with that said, you know, we've all made wrong turns in life. We've gotten off track. You know, we sped up when we should have slowed down and plain old missed some exits all together, and you got to go down to another exit and turn around and not to mention even going the wrong way down a one-way street. Hello. <laughs> Done it. But our purpose and destiny is not the wrong turns and, and worrying about the bad decisions we made. It's, it's about getting back on track in the direction that God has ordained for you. You know, the call of Scripture is, is to put the past behind and take today for what it is. You know, to say from this moment on that I'm going to be straining, reaching forward mm -hmm. in the race to become more like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Forgetting what's behind and the time that's been wasted because there's no time like today. Yeah. You can't do anything about the time that you've wasted, the time that's gone by. Start the day. If today's the first day, so be it. You know, we need to forget in a sense even some of the great victories that we've even had. Because that's in the past too. Mm -hmm. And that can sometimes lull you into a false sense of thinking that everything is all right. You know, I, I wanted this, I did that, you know, and then you get caught up. Mm -hmm. So verse 14 goes on to say, I press towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, sometimes you can, you know, some of, some of you are, are blessed enough to have been retired from a job. You get up and you're able to kind of do the things that you want to do. So retirement is a good thing, but as Christians, we never retire from pressing on to be more like Christ. So that's whether you're in the, the young adult choir or the senior choir. All you're right. still required to press on. My Lord. Now, now, for some of you... Uh, uh, Pastor Jackson did a great job this morning talking about the NBA Finals. Uh, so just so just think about for a minute that if the team that won the Super Bowl uh, this past February or the World Series last year or the Miami Heat that won the NBA championship last year, if they rested on what they did in the past. Yeah. You know, they, they worked really hard and, and won the championship. They went to practice. They played real hard. And, you know, this year, this upcoming year, they decided – not to show up for any practice. Uh -huh. Like Allen Iverson, practice. 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 What? Let's practice. You know, they just, go in, they just go into every single game and they, they go, you know, they show up on the court, on the field, and say, uh, you guys know we won last year, right? So, you know, we're supposed to show up tonight and give you the biz tonight. And the other team would probably just laugh them right off the field of the court because they went to practice yesterday. And that's what we're supposed to do every day. Go to practice. Going to practice for us again is getting in our words. Praying, getting on your knees and having your eyes forward every day. That's what it is for us. So if you want to continue to stay a champion, you have to put in the work that's required of that. The discipline through the practice that we have to do. In this Christian life, there's a call to continue discipline. And that's to continue to press on. We need to be single-minded about this one fact. We need to learn not to be just plain distracted by all the things in the world that are put before us. Everybody's got bills. Everybody's got some kind of problem somewhere, got some sickness somewhere, got something going on with them that could easily distract you and take your eyes off the prize. Because the distractions on the side of you and in the rear view, that's the sickness, that's the, I just lost my job, or just, just whatever that is. But if you're looking out the rear view mirror, it don't even matter what's happening over here because you're looking forward. And you need to, to, to just be single-minded on that focus and, and just keep your mind on the eternal things of life. You know, it's, it's easy to become distracted and look away from your goal of becoming like Christ. You know, there's a, there's a reason that they put, uh, I don't know if, how many people are really familiar with horse racing, but there's, there's a reason why they put blinders on a horse. Now that horse got a jockey on his back with a strap and a whip just 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 flogging him like no other business. He got a strap and a bit in his mouth with a jockey still controlling him and pulling him like that. But still that horse, you know, if somebody tried to jump on your back right now, I've got a feeling right now you kind of go with that strap and that whip would tell you to go. I mean, that's just human nature. But that horse, 
even with all that beating that he's taking, he still got to have something on his eyes to keep him straight forward because he'd be all over the track. Uh -huh. With all of that being said, you know, the same thing with, uh, if you ever seen dog races, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll shoot the gun at a dog race and if you look up on that rail, they got a little fake white rabbit that goes around the whole track. They didn't have that up there. Dogs would be all up in the stands and everywhere else. <laughs> so even they have to have something that singularly focuses their attention to go around that track and run their best. And it's to keep them focused. So that's similar to what Paul is calling our attention to here. He's calling us to be single-minded towards the goal of becoming like Christ. You know, yes, there, there are some things that are good, but there's only one thing that's the best. And those things are the things that count towards your eternal mark the things that, that make us live lives more like, like Jesus. You know, when we run in the race, it's not time to stop and, you know, check our shoes and make sure they tied up, check your, 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 your watch and look up in the stand and wave at your family because you're going to lose the race. Yeah. I mean, imagine if you saw somebody in the race doing that. That would be, you're like, what is this guy doing? He's not focused. Yeah. He's not focused. And you know that God has a purpose for your life. God put you on this earth for a reason. He has a purpose that he has only for you. And God has something exciting in store for each and every one of you. And what your exciting is is different than what my exciting is. But it still comes from him anyway. So you got to trust him. You know, you got to continue to press on. You got to continue to develop a spiritual maturity. And that's where uh, verse 15 and 16 come into play. You know, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear for you. So even if you got some other kind of mind about something else, if you stay focused on him, he'll, he'll make that clear and plain to you if you want it to be. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. So in our salvation, we've been called to be like Christ. So now we must live up to that call and develop the spiritual maturity that goes along with it. We must press on in a single-minded service to Christ. Spiritual maturity is not instant. Again, it's not like instant grits. You know, I'd rather have the, the old-fashioned grits on. and then ones that come in that, that shake up and put some water in, throw it in the microwave, in five minutes you got some grits. No, I'd rather have my grandma, I'd rather have my grandma make me some grits with some sausage yes, in it. Oh, all right. <laughs> not even gonna go there. <laughs> you know, so, but there are times that, that we call for an immediate decision, you know, sometimes that, you know, we ask people to commit their lives to Christ on the spot, and we, we have them come on down the aisle, and, you know, but what if that was just all there was? There'd be, there's no journey after that if that's all there was, you know. You know, we ask for that call to give your life to Christ, but we never really call to instantly receive spiritual maturity, because you can't. It takes time. It comes by a process, and that's what the pilgrimage and the journey is. It's an ongoing commitment to Jesus Christ. You know, we attain salvation, but we continue to seek spiritual maturity. You know, we ask God to forgive us. He gives us that, that salvation because we ask, but then we've got to put in the work to seek and reach for him. So we must recognize that we need to press on. You know, we begin to reach the mark of spiritual maturity through spiritual discipline. You know, I've said that several times, so that's a, that's, that's a big point, and Paul says that several times throughout the Bible. Spiritual maturity is not looking for shortcuts, you know, like that, that, that hare did in the race. It can't be looking for shortcuts. Spiritual maturity is coming to the Christian life for the long term, the long haul, to look for Christ in the good times and the hard times. And the hard times is when you need to press on the most because that's when you're leaning fully on him. And that's what the call is. Truly, that's what the call is. God's purpose for you m will mean keeping your eyes fixed totally on him. Because again, if you get distracted, you can't listen to what he's saying. You can't follow directions that he's giving. You know, so we should have that goal that Paul had to become like Christ. We have the same call right in our lives to keep pressing on. Maturity is being teachable and being willing to listen to what God has to say to us. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 40 years or for just 40 days. The key to spiritual maturity is just being teachable and allowing God to work 
in you and through you. Being willing to move on and, and I mean, that's really what pressing on is all about. Keep fighting, keep moving forward, keep endurance. You know, it, it's something to be said for, for people who endure things. You know, you get stronger. You know, first time a sign of weakness or something comes up that's too tough for us when we want to quit, that's when you lose ground. So it's a matter of priorities. It's a matter of finding out what is really important in your life and going after it. You know, spiritual maturity, again, is that growth process, so we got to be willing to grow with it. It's like planting, you know, if you, uh, any of you know about, well, we, we here from Robinson County, people know about gardening here. You know, if you plant, uh, you plant pumpkin seeds in the ground, you can't expect a crop of corn to come up. <laughs> so you've got to plant to grow. Now, if you don't, now here's the thing about, here's the thing about a field. If you don't plant seeds, you're still going to get growth. But what kind of growth is it going to be? Weeds. Things that choke off everything around you. That kill every kind of life around you. So you've got to plant. In our case, it's planting the word in our souls and in our hearts so that the weeds don't come in and choke them off and take it from us. And that's where that single-minded process is becoming like Christ. It's like riding a bike. You know, you know, if you get on a bike right now, you know, you flip the kickstand back and you just sit on that bike and you don't pedal, what's going to happen? You're going to fall. So even in that, you got to pedal. You got to press forward. You got to do something to keep your balance and keep yourself from falling short. So when you press on, you actually become a threat to the devil because he expects us to quit the race. Because that's what's prevalent in human nature is to quit about everything that we start. You know, you ever notice that, you know, when you, when you start something worthwhile and it's, it's real tough for a minute, you feel a little pressure to keep going. But if you quit, you know, that pressure is relieved. You know, because quitting is easy. You know, so you know, I'll give you a, a, another example. You know, some of us like to stay up n late at night and, you know, you look on those infomercials. You know, you may be flipping through the channels and you see the, you know, you get all excited by the, the tilt tut titans and the, or the weight buster 5,000 or, or whatever that you see. And, uh, you know, I mean, you catch my drift. So you get on the phone and, and you, uh, you pick up the phone and you order whatever it is that you see because you're so excited. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to, to jump on the machine or, or do the program or whatever. And you can't wait. To the point, you know, where you you set up the the three flex, the easy payment plans, or, or whatever that you, whatever that you do, and then you get so excited that you even pay the extra money for the express shipping and handling to get it to your house in three days. You know, you get it, and you 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 jump on the machine, or you jump on the program, and you the first week, man, you gung ho. You know, six days, you out, you mean you doing jumping jacks, and you jump around the house, looking, you know, kids looking at you like you're crazy or whatever, but you're excited, you're excited. You know, week number two comes and well, you're a little sore, your hamstring hurting a little bit. So you might go down about four days. Here comes week number three and you're down to two days. And by week number four, you go, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Uh -huh. Hey, I'm guilty of that. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm pointing the finger at me. So, uh, and you know, you, you quit the thing before you even made one payment on, on the $29.99, the three flex page. You done quit the whole thing. So then we, we get up and then we see our friend at work, you know, they, they done ordered the program because we were walking around work saying how excited we were to get the thing and I'm about to get it and I'm about to tilt, tuck and weight bust and everything else. So they get it, they order it too. And then you look at them two months later, they done lost 35 pounds and they look great. They run around the office with all kind of energy. Why? You quit, they didn't. And then you wonder, man, what happened? And they looking at you like, man, what happened? <laughs> You know, so again, it's something to be said about people who don't quit. So that means you got, that's the pressing on part. That's the straining forward part. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's people in the Bible who, who, uh, who, who pressed on. Paul pressed on. David pressed on. Because, I mean, think about it. He had a seven, you know, he's, you know, the smallest man out there in the field. And here comes this nine foot giant. And this little dude looks at him and like, what's up? <laughs> that's pressing on. You know, the tallest person I ever saw was Alonzo Mourning. 
talked to him and had a conversation with him several years ago and I know I'm looking at him and he's a seven foot man and I know I'm looking at him and, and Goliath was two feet taller than that. So you can imagine what little David did. He grabbed the slingshot and he went to work. <laughs> Joseph pressed on. You know, because you know, here, here comes his wife. You know, everybody talking about him, and but but here he goes. He know he had a call to deliver Jesus and 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 put him towards the direction where he was supposed to go. Noah pressed on when everybody called him an absolute fool. Man, ain't no rain coming. What's wrong with you? You building this big old? What what is wrong with you? But he pressed on anyway because he did what God told him to do. He was obedient. Moses did the same thing. He gets to the edge right there at the Red Sea, and he done delivered the Israelites, and, you know, they, they were giving him all the all glory, and, you know, thank you, Moses, for, for getting us out and saving us, and he get right there to the edge of the Red Sea, and they look at him then, and that's when people start turning on you then. When it, when it gets a, a little hairy, you know, they say, uh, man, look at where this, this guy, where he, he done led us to the edge, and now, now what you going to do? But Moses looked to God and said, God, help me. Uh -huh. So God told him to press on. He made a way. He's part of the sea. The impossible. The impossible. But that all came because he decided to press on. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and, and how about the biggest one of all, Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to tell you what now. If it, was, if it was up to me, if I would have been put in that same position, we'd all be messed up in here right now. <laughs> because he pressed on knowing full well what was going to happen to him. He knew it. But he pressed on anyway, and we're all the better for it. So, uh, you know, and it's, and it's something that all of these people that I just described and talked about, they were faced with insurmountable odds and conditions that that couldn't even be thought about or pondered right now. And they seemed like they couldn't face it or move on, but what did they do? They pressed on because God told them to. You know, as I, as I get ready to take my seat, you, I realize that, you know, that God won't tell you to go through any, any doorway that he hadn't already prepared for you. He won't tell you to do that because he's a, he's, he's a just and faithful God. Yes, he is. And all he wants you to do is, is trust him, and he won't send you into any battle that he hadn't already won for you. All right. So what we have to do is continue to move forward by trusting God's word because he keeps his word. Mm -hmm. And there's only one thing that God can't do, and that's fail. Yeah. Only thing he can't do is fail. So in conclusion, what are you going to do, press on or press out? Thank you. Amen. 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 Okay, beloved, you have been here and you've witnessed what the Lord has done with this young man. Amen? And I'm not sure. I know what I've seen. I've seen someone who studied. Someone who put time in the word to bring all of that out of the word. Amen? And so he's, he's diligent and he's serious about this call. Now, if you believe the Lord called him, stand on your feet and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. They believe. They believe. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We